Good morning, church. It's good to have you with us. Did you enjoy the fish fry last weekend? That was awesome, wasn't it? And I'm glad that uh, we were able to do that. Uh, just next time you see Terry or Rick or any of the ones that uh, were helping with the frying and the breading outside, let them know how much you appreciated that. And also thank you for all the ladies and all who helped with homemade ice cream and all those desserts, all those sides. And that was, uh, that was a blessing for this congregation. We had several that were visiting from town. And we have visitors today, and I'm glad to see you here. And we want to just welcome you here and hope that you uh, uh, are uplifted and encouraged through our worship assembly, through the message that you're about to hear, and also just uh, to, be know, uh, to know that you're welcome to come back anytime you have the opportunity. Uh, we had a great time at the family retreat this last weekend. Uh, yesterday, uh, we got to spend some time in scripture and in singing and got to enjoy a beautiful view. Uh, the view that's from Inspiration Point at, at Camp Horizon looks back towards the north of the Arkansas River, towards where the lake is. And I could point out things and places that I have been and where I hunted or fished. And, and that was really neat. And got to see on the way up a bald eagle already, this early in the year, a bald eagle perched up on a tree and several pelicans flying over and lots of signs for uh, wildlife. As you know, I'm a deer hunter. Tomorrow's a national holiday, October 1, the beginning of bow season. I'm not going to hunt if it's really, really warm, though, but I hear some cool weather's on its way. Uh, if you would, please, get your Bibles ready for uh, Luke chapter 9. Open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. I want to talk this morning about making difficult decisions. Now, before I get started, I needed to say one more thing, and that was uh, I'm not here next Sunday. Uh, Mike Napier will be here. Mike is going to be talking about the work that is going on in Africa called the Gospel Chariot Ministries. And uh, Mike, as you know, has been battling cancer as well, but he has been appreciative of all the prayers and support. And you might recall also that Mike's son, Chad, my predecessor here in the pulpit, preached here for many years. He was in a terrible automobile accident this week, rolled the vehicle three times, broke some front teeth off. He had no broken bones, thank God. He's doing well. He had just got through uh, dropping off his daughter for school, and a guy changed, got into his lane, and it was a head-on collision. He's very blessed to be alive, and Mike will give us an update next week. I did talk to Chad, too. Chad said thank, thanks to the congregation for all the prayers and support, but he is sore, very, very much in pain, especially his back. So just keep them in your prayers, both Mike and Chad. But Mike will be here next Sunday, which kicks off in the month of October, as you know, is our Missions Month. And uh, the last Sunday of October is Mission Sunday. And all the contribution that's been given on that day will be going towards all the mission work we're involved in. That includes Africa, Ecuador, India, Westview Boys Home, the search program, uh, and uh, a few other things that we help out here and there. But it will help us, and our goal this year is to raise $34,000 on the last Sunday of the month of October. That's, uh, we exceeded that last year, and we'd like to do that this year to keep our level of work and commitment going. So be thinking and praying about that. I will be in Stillwater preaching to the congregation there because it's also their missions month, and they have various people representing the uh, areas they support. And so I'm going next week to uh, talk about our recent trip to India. And they had a few college students from Stillwater that went with, uh, not with our team, but were there the same time our team was there. So I'll be, I'll be doing that next Sunday morning and next Sunday night. I will be going to the Hennessy congregation and giving the same presentation there since they helped Lindy financially on her trip. Tonight, a fifth Sunday, we don't have evening services here. But be thinking about me in prayer because I'm going to be traveling to Burlington to give the same presentation there. They had three of their members that went with us on our India team. But lots of mission things going on. That's why I'm saying that. So I'm not here for next Sunday. There'll be a combined class. Mike will do the class in the auditorium. And then he will do the sermon uh, that morning. And uh, the following Sunday, I will be here. But Kent Markham of the Ecuador work will be here doing, again, a combined class in the auditorium, as well as preaching the sermon. So that's a little bit of the, the housekeeping announcements I needed to make. Luke chapter 9. I want to begin reading in verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely 
set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. Verse 57, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. In verse 60, Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go and go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Let's pray about this. Father, thank you so much for the day that we have to worship you. We thank you, Father, for the love that we feel from each other and the love that's been expressed on the cross by your giving your one and only Son, Jesus, to die for our sins. Father, it is our goal in this church to serve you all the days of our life and that we will be able to pledge our love and allegiance to Jesus, having him as our Lord and our Master, or he's already our Redeemer and Savior. And we pray, Father, that we're able to share the love that he shared with us with all the people that we know through kind works, deeds, and good behavior and positive, optimistic communication. Father, let's build each other up instead of tearing each other down. There's too much of that already in our country, and we want to be an example of how to be positive and optimistic and to demonstrate love and things that lead to peace, not things that polarize. Father, help us in decision-making, that we're able to make the decision that best glorifies you and not just best suits our own selfish needs. Help us to learn what the cost of discipleship really is about because we recognize the ultimate price Jesus made on the cross for all of us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, as, as Jordan and I were talking about this kind of in, a, in kind of an informal staff meeting about what was coming up for the church, we knew Missions Month was coming up, and so that's all reserved for talking about mission work stuff and having other people come in and talk about that. I knew I didn't have enough time to really start a study of a book or a series like we just completed a study of the book of Titus together, talking about the climate change needed on the island of Crete in a spiritual way. And so we'd have a couple of Sundays in here. We do this little thing where we come in the auditorium and I have him kind of sit, sit in the pew here. And I'm actually standing here. Nobody else is in the building. Melba thinks this is really weird, by the way, as she's watching and hearing us uh, from her office. But we're, we, just, we have him... Jordan throws out three topics, and off the cuff, I speak to one of those topics at a time for about two or three minutes, and then he votes which one he liked the best that I should develop as a sermon. And this is early on in the week that we do that. Now, we did this a couple of weeks ago because, yes, sometimes the well runs dry, okay? I, and the creative juices just weren't flowing enough, and I needed some help, so we played that game. And Jordan really gets into this, but he had... He had suggested this topic first, and I ran with that for a little bit, and then he suggested a, a topic that really kind of flopped, and another topic that was really good. You heard that one last week in the eye of the storm. And even though I like this topic better, it just seemed like with uh, Hurricane Florence and all of that, it was, it was timed right to have in the eye of the storm last week. How many of you remember last week? Good, y'all do pay attention to my sermons. That's good, that's great. But the first one was this one. Now, granted, it's been a couple of weeks ago, and I had forgotten all of that I said in that little trial run. So it's a completely different sermon. So whether this gets a thumbs up or down, I don't know. But let me start off by saying this. The, the topic was making difficult choices and the will of God. You and I start off with freedom of will, and we have freedom of will to make choices for God. It starts off in the garden that way, doesn't it? In the creation story. 
There's a tree over here you can partake of. There's a tree over here. Do not eat of it. But the choice is yours. This was called the tree of... Let's start over. There's two trees. What tree was Adam and Eve allowed to eat of? The tree of... The tree of life. And over here was that tree that was of the knowledge of good and evil. This is the tree that the serpent, which was Satan in the form of a serpent, came up to Eve and said, did God say not eat of that tree? And she said, yeah, he did. And he said, well, there's a reason for that because, and I'm paraphrasing this, but you can read this all in the book of Genesis, those first two and three chapters there. He said, he knows that when you eat of it, you'll become like him knowing the difference from good and evil. That's, that's, that's the only reason. And she looked at it, and it did look good for food. It looked delicious, and so she took a bite. She had a choice. Say that with me. She had a choice. God does not force anybody to serve him. He wants people to choose to serve him. How would it be in relationships with, between children and parents? And by the way, children... You do have to do what moms and dads say. But parents, you know what the difference is when they do things because they chose to do it, because they love you, rather than looking at it as drudgery because I have to. Now, I've used this before, but sometimes things just didn't make sense, and I'd often go to my mom and dad, who's in the audience this morning. Uh, I would say, but why? Why? And you know what the response was, because some of you read out of the same textbook my parents did, because I said so. How many of you heard that growing up? Because I said so. And, and, and while it's true that God is God and He's sovereign and His heavenly Father, he's, he's our Creator, He has every right to demand you to do what He said do. And when we say why, He can say what? Because I said so. Right? He's God and you're not. He's God and I'm not. And we have to submit to that. But he does give us choice. Now, if you don't choose to do what I say, if you go your own way, that's your choice. And, and the idea, I think, behind choice is wouldn't you rather have people that choose to serve you, choose to respect you, choose to love you, than to try to fabricate that and force that? Do you understand the difference? We have choice. And it was in the garden. And we have all through the Bible examples of when choices had to be made, when there was an opportunity to make a choice, a choice to do whatever was right or a choice to do whatever was wrong, a choice to go this way or that way, the right or the left. Pineapple on pizza or not. Well, that's not in the Bible. Remember Joshua? Towards the end of his life, after having led Israel into the land of Canaan, he would say, Choose yourselves this day whom you will serve. You remember that? He says, you can serve the gods of the, of the Egyptians, you know, the place where our ancestors came from, from slavery, all their gods, or the god of the Amorites or the Ammonites on whose land you're living used to dwell. And then he makes this statement, as for me and my household, we will serve who? The Lord. But you got choice, don't you? Choose yourselves. You've got the choice. The ball is in your court. But what will you choose? And then you've got some foolish decisions that were made. I think of Jephthah, for example, who said, God, if you allow me to have that victory in this battle, I'll offer whatever comes through my gate when I get back home. To, to whatever comes through my gate... To welcome me back, he wasn't thinking that this would be a person, by the way. He would think that this would be an animal to sacrifice an altar. I'll give it to you. But it was his daughter that came through the gate. And he had a difficult choice to make, didn't he? And there's, the Bible is full of difficult, tough choices. Keep this marked because we're going to come back to it. But if you would with me, turn over to Philippians chapter 1. In Philippians 1, the Apostle Paul, you know, divinely inspired, 
divine appointed apostle Paul had trouble deciding what to choose. This is in Philippians chapter 1 beginning in verse 20. He says this, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body. By the way, he's in prison when he's writing this. He's in prison and he knows he knows trouble because of his commitment to the gospel preaching of Jesus Christ that his life is a life full of risks. He has been stoned and left for dead in one particular area. He's in prison because of his public proclamation of Jesus as Lord. And look at what he says next, verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, right off the bat, this is an interesting perspective because most people dread death. Most people do not look forward to death or look at death as gain. We're doing everything we possibly can with all kinds of herbs and supplements and vitamins and medication to live longer and to look younger, by the way. How am I doing? But he says to die is gain. It's gain. But that's the Christian perspective. Because we know something's better than this world is offering. Amen to that. This world is just, it's not our home. It's just a place we're passing through. Philippians 3.20 will say our citizenship is in heaven. And we know that that's a better place because there's no death there. There's no disease there. There's no crying there. There's no night there. There's no mourning there. There's no junk of this world there. There's no excess baggage there. This is all what God has in store for us. What Adam and Eve had, by the way, before the fall. And he goes on to say in verse 22, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I what? Choose. And then he says, I do not know. And in verse 23, I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. I mean, what he's saying is, I know what would benefit y'all, but I know what I selfishly want. And I have to admit it. Staying with y'all will be a benefit, and and I know it will have fruitful labor, and I know there's going to be something good of that. But if you're asking me what I really think, it's better for me to depart and be with the Lord better by far. But he said, I'm torn between the two. I'm torn between the two. This was a difficult thing for Paul to think about as far as choices were concerned. Now let's go to our text, Luke 9. Now this sets up a a chronological timeline for us. When he says in verse 51, it was time for him, Jesus, to be taken up to heaven. That's a That's a reference to dying on the cross. And he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. That's heading towards Jerusalem, his final time to be there for his final week. And the entrance into Jerusalem for his final week, as you know, we call that the triumphal entry. He will be there for the week then, and he will be there until he is put on the cross, crucified for our sins. He is determined to go there, and it's for that reason he doesn't stop in Samaria and speak with those people, and they don't welcome him there because he's heading to a different direction. He's heading towards Jerusalem. And when he gets there, in verse 57 of the text, it says, As they're walking along the road, they're heading to Jerusalem, they're traveling together, a man said, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, this is, a, this is a, a great affirmation of somebody who's watched Jesus, possibly heard Jesus, he sees Jesus, he perhaps knows Jesus, he's been with Jesus maybe for a couple of days now. I don't know if it's somebody 
off on the side of the road or somebody traveling with him along with the rest of the disciples. But for whatever reason, he feels compelled. He's got to make that statement. I want to go with you, Jesus. Now, there's nothing wrong in that. And as a matter of fact, it's something that each of us as a disciple or a follower of Jesus should be ready to be able to pledge to Jesus. I'm going to go with you. I'm following you. Jesus has called us to be followers, hasn't he? But Jesus puts them to a little test in verse 58 when he says, Foxes have holes and birds have nests. And what he's saying there, and you may think this is kind of a strange thing that he's saying, but he's just simply saying the wildlife even have homes to go back to. There are holes in the ground or nests in the tree. Where do you think I'm hanging out at? Holiday Inn? Do you realize I've really got no place here to call home and to set up residence? And his very life shows that he was on the move all the time. Being born in Bethlehem, which was not the home of either his mom or dad, but it was ancestral ties there. And then scuffled off to Egypt because of a wicked Herod and then coming back but was diverted going up to Nazareth and centered around a lot of his youth around Capernaum. He was kind of of a nomadic lifestyle. And he says, where do you think it is I'm heading? Where do you think I'm going? You need to realize before you make that commitment to me that you're going to go wherever I am, have you really considered where it is I'm going? Now Jesus knows the cross is at the end of the road, and this guy probably doesn't. He said to another man, verse 59, follow me. But the man replied, well, okay, let me first go and bury my father. Now, this may seem like it's a crude thing, Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. Why would you want to go do that for? We think, well, that's a dignifying way to honor our loved ones, right? And I don't think Jesus at this point is saying, be mean to your own family. But what he is asking people to do before they make a commitment is, have you considered that it's possible that if you're really going to follow me, family is going to be upstaged by putting God first. I think we know that. When anybody pledges they're going to defend our country and joins one of the armed forces, that that means sometimes family has to sacrifice time while I'm away. We recognize the value of that, to defend our freedom in this land. Doesn't God expect the same and doesn't he deserve even more loyalty for when we needed to to follow him that not even family will upstage our priority with God? God needs to be first in everything. That's the point he's making. And still another said in verse 61, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. What we see here is demonstrated by three different fellows, uh, one who just flat out says, I'll go with you. And then Jesus asked another one to, and here's a guy saying, I'll go with you. And Jesus is wondering, is this lip service or are you really going to have your heart in it? Because I know Jesus probably knows enough about human interaction that sometimes we're quick and fast to say, yes, sign me up. And a week later, I'm done. It's not what I thought it was going to be. I'm sorry. I'm backing out. And day number two, we're throwing in the towel. And Jesus says, before you make that commitment to me, and I think it's the same today by, by when we become a Christian, when we make that commitment to Jesus Christ, and we're going to say, I'm going to be your follower. Jesus wants to know, have you really thought this through? Because it is a commitment. And there's risks involved. And I'm not staying in no Holiday Inn or having a lot of luxuries in life here, a lot of comforts for humanity here. Do you know if you follow me, you go to a cross? And he's up front with us, isn't he? When he says, if any man wants to follow me, he must first, what? Deny himself. And then what? Take up his cross and follow me daily. He's up front with us when he says... If you're going to follow me, here's what it takes. But you will be rewarded. Now, this is the choice we have to make, and it's a difficult choice maybe. But God wants all people everywhere saved. God has not predetermined where it is you're going to be. He's given you the choice, and we get to choose. Will we follow? Will we stay? Or will we go? 
Will we do what Jesus says? Are we going to be like Jesus, Father? Let this cup pass, but not my will, but your will be done. And instead, say your will instead of, Father, my will be done. Which wills is it? Whose will is it? Yours or His? Choose yourselves whom you're going to serve. The choice is yours. There's another story. You don't have to turn there, but I'll reference it in Mark 10 about the rich young ruler. This guy comes running up to Jesus. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Raise your hand if you remember that story. And Jesus says, well, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you? And he goes through some of the commandments. And he says to Jesus, I've done all that. Since I was young, I've done all that. What? And Jesus says, well, there's one thing you lack. What's that? He says, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and follow me. Now, you see, this guy had a hang-up because he's very wealthy. Now, it's not that riches are sinful. It's the love of money is the root of all evil, not, not money itself. And Jesus knew this isn't just a story about a guy who has a lot of wealth. This is a story about wealth who has a guy. And it held him back. And in Mark 10, the end of the story said that guy went away sad because he had great wealth. He had made a choice to not follow Jesus. I'll close with this passage. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. As you're thinking about your life, your commitment level, and maybe decisions that you make on a day-to-day -day basis, and we all have these choices to make, and you're wondering, I wonder if this honors God or not. Is this in accordance with God's will or not? I want you to consider this passage from Deuteronomy 30, beginning in verse 15. Moses, recording the will of God here, says in verse 15, Deuteronomy 30, 15, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. You know what he's just described there? The correlated scenario of the garden. Tree of and the tree of life and prosperity, or death and destruction. I'm setting that before you today just as it was set before Adam and Eve in the garden. I'm setting that before you today. In other words, you've got a choice. And he says, verse 16, For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways and to keep His commands, decrees and laws, and then you will live and increase, and the Lord will bless you in the land where you're entering to possess. In other words, you choose life, and you won't regret it. But you're the one that has to choose. You're the one that has to do that. And if you choose the other, that's your choice. And he says this in verse 17. But if your heart turns away and you're not obedient. In other words, you choose death and destruction. And by the way, that choice doesn't ever present itself on the outside surface as death and destruction, does it? The serpent was able to masquerade what it meant to Eve if she were to partake of the forbidden fruit. He made it look good to her, and it appeared to be good to her. But it wasn't good, was it? It wasn't good at all. But he's going to dress sin up as something that's attractive. And he says, if your heart turns away and you're not obedient, and if you're drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, Verse 18, I declare to you this, that this day that you will certainly be destroyed and you will not live long in the land you're crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. Now, which will it be? And then he says this in verse 19, This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, the two choices, blessings and curses. And then he says, now choose what? Life. Here they are. Go with this one. Go with this one. Life. So that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God and listen to his voice and hold fast to him for the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was presented in the garden. It was presented in Deuteronomy. 
I think it's presented when the rich young ruler came up to Jesus in Mark 10. I think it's represented in Luke's gospel, chapter 9, we just looked at. And guess what? It's presented to us today, whether you call it a tree or not, or if it's a mountain of choices, or it's just over here and it's over here. You get to choose. And as heaven and earth are witnesses right here and now, God marks up what choice you make. He makes note of it. And right now is an opportunity for you, and I'm asking you to consider choosing life. Right? And for you, that might mean I've got to start following Jesus. And how do you start? You do what everybody did that started. They committed, they, they repented, they loved, they, they believed, and they were baptized for forgiveness of sins to have a fresh, clean start. And that's how you start. And maybe you think, well, I've started before, but somewhere I dropped the ball. Come back and pick it up and start over again. You can start over again. That's the good news about the cross. God keeps forgiving. Choose life. And if that's your choice, then why don't you come up here to the front and let us know about that as we stand and sing this song. Choose life.